back again. We're still covering the period from 545. And we're really starting to get into 565 when Justinian dies. He dies right here at Ep. It's short for Epi. And where you see that little apostrophe there, um, it's actually in the text. The apostrophe isn't in the text. It might be in later editions of the Bible. But that's a form of shortening off or cutting off the final vowel to avoid something called hiatus. So you don't have to say epi auton. You just say ep auton. Hiatus means that the that the, you're going from one vowel to the next vowel with no intervening consonant. And that was considered inelegant in Greek just like it's considered inelegant in French today. Now, the focus, therefore, is how did this come about? Chai hepta kefalai hepta chore eshin. Pu hegune kateitai epauton. Okay. The seven heads, seven mountains are where the woman sits upon them. Okay, at upon Justinian is dead. And what I was trying to do is I was trying to establish that he is at a nadir. His wife has died. He's on the outs, you know, through his own action. Um, Justinian had fired his, his, what had to become by this point his best friend, his general. Because the general's wife was best friends with Theodora. Theodora herself had died here, and that could explain why, you know, Justinian was crazy besides the fact that he had contracted yet survived the bubonic plague here. And what I had tried to say and didn't cover all the details needed was that from the period of 545 here to 558 here when Constantinople is almost overrun by only 2,000 cavalry. That's how weak it was and 300 soldiers that 80-year-old Belisarius takes out to, to stop is what saved Constantinople, which they called Rome. They might have called it Constantinople by then because Constantine had died, but Constantine called it Rome. So they were at the whole city, the whole empire was at an Adir. They didn't have the resources. They didn't keep up the walls. 2,000 cavalry from the Kodigers, which it's a long story how they ended up doing that, were at the Long Walls, or just about to be at the Long Walls, and Belisarius stopped them with 300 troops. That's all they had to protect them. The wars in here, it sounded real good at first. Oh, okay, we'll go to Africa, and that was 533, 534. And oh, we have a victory. Yeah, it lasted like six months. Because here's 535 and 536 when they take over Rome from a base in Africa. But they start to lose Africa right away. And not only that, but then Justinian ends up recalling our boy, okay, to fight the Persians who are starting to fight right here in 540. Meanwhile, he spent all this money building a stinking temple because his noose, his mind was crazy and empty of God. And when people are like that, they turn religious and they build buildings and they invent rituals and they get real crusady and all that stuff, how holy they are by what they do and not by what they learn. So he didn't learn these words that he could have read natively. He was born, you know, initially speaking Latin, but he learned Greek soon enough. Why didn't he notice that this applies to him? Per syllable. Okay? And what did God do? 
Well, as soon as he, as soon as Belisarius leaves Rome here, he gets taken back over by the Goths. So no sooner is the temple finished here, than here at Noos, this is like 538, see 533, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Everything's falling apart, including Africa. I didn't mention that before. Africa's falling apart too. Because he stretched his money and his and he only had this really one guy that he relied on and he was sort of jealous of him. And that's part of the reason he gets recalled. Because there was always somebody Belisarius. Belisarius wants your job. Okay, and it was so bad that Africa started to revolt too. And then Belisarius went back and forth still in Italy at that point. Okay? And it wasn't until here, 540, that he won over at Ravenna, which was on the other side of the boot, on the right-hand side of the boot, kind of north, up toward the top of the boot. And how, how did he win? By giving in to the Goths, saying, hi, we'll make you king instead of Justinian. So how do you think Justinian's going to feel? Even though as soon as, as, soon as um, Belisarius captured Ravenna, as if he were going to accept being, you know, emperor himself. He, he, you know, gives it over for Justinian. And so he, Justinian calls him back, and now he's going to Persia. That's a big distance from Italy to the Far Eastern Empire. And what else is going is the plague that's going here from Africa, okay, because, you know, they have to start fighting in Africa again. So now the troops are coming back up into the Middle East. And the Middle East is also warring with him because they don't like all the rules against the Monophysites and against the Jews and against the pagans. And so the plague is coming up, and here's where it hits Constantinople. And, you know, like one-third at least of the people die in that whole region. So from Italy through Africa, through the Middle East, people are dying, and here it finally hits Constantinople. Does anybody learn? No. Okay? So now that's 544. And it's on again, off again with Rome. It's on right at that point because everybody's so sick. Okay? Even the, even the Persians take off a little bit. Okay, but here it's 545, and you know what happened? The Ostrogoths recover from whatever sickness they had, and they have besieged Rome. So it's not just the northern people that I told you about. Africa is also back into being restive again. Okay, so then there are troops that have to be sent back to it to, to quell it, despite the plague. Despite it. This is how, how callous everybody is. And right here at 545 in Rome, the Pope, in, Rome is under siege. And what I had told you in the last increment was, right here at Jorge, which is 553, Justinian the crazy, partly crazy because of the plague, and partly crazy because he lost his wife, and then went, then be, because of the Italy thing starting up again, and the Persian thing starting up again, there's some kind of, you know, upset between him and, and Belisarius, because Belisarius isn't doing well to retake Rome. And so Justinian gets all upset again. And here at this point, he says, I'm the head of the church, there ain't no other. Well, he had started saying that, really, right here in 545, to the Pope in Italy. Now, you have, I, I need to clarify something. When we hear today of all this talk of Popes, there really weren't Popes. There was some head teacher in Rome that everybody subscribed to, some head teacher in Alexandria, Egypt, everybody subscribed to, some head teacher in Antioch, everybody subscribed to, and it was a question of wh what teacher do you belong? It was exactly what Paul warned against in 1 Corinthians 5. All these little teams fighting each other, and it became political, and all that really started in 118 AD. 
but it wasn't called pulp because there wasn't how you want to call it they, they didn't think of themselves that way there wasn't one ruler of the church ever okay that's something that would come about almost a thousand years later okay about 500 years after Justinian there was really no such thing as Pope there but the bishop in Rome was considered important and Justinian wanted his agreement to a rule Justinian set condemning certain teachers in order to get some kind of alleged unity in the Council of Chalcedon which had been passed back up here okay right up here in 541 uh, 451 rather Okay, that's what he was trying to do. And it was a doctrinal war that Justinian got totally involved in, and he wanted to dictate the outcome, and he wanted to dictate it to the Roman bishop. We call it Pope, but it was no such thing really as Pope then. Okay, he wanted to dictate it to him. So he sent a boat in 545, which is what this black covers. While Rome was under siege, he sent a boat that he ordered the Pope Bishop to get on and come to him, which that Bishop did not do. I think his name was Vigilius or something. I forget his exact name. Anyway, he didn't really do what Justinian claimed, but he got on the boat, but then he put off and spent a year or two or three in what was either Sicily or Sardinia or something like that. He took his sweet time to get there. Meanwhile, Justinian is just stewing, and he's so mad that this guy isn't actually coming to him as ordered that he orders all of his own bishops that he has control over in Alexandria and Antioch and the other places of the Eastern Roman Empire to come and sit and, and pass what he wanted passed, and that was in f by 553, but it took, it took until here. For that to happen at which point he imposes on the Roman bishop hi you're gonna just accede to what I passed even though you weren't there because you refused to come or I'm not gonna help you defend you from the gospel which that bishop wanted so this year 554 the bishop of Rome gives in so that whole thing had started here and that's what causes the, the War of Italy to end. All right. Now, in the middle, I had said that there was something bad that happened. 545, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, right here at the end of Kefali. So he loses his wife. He gets in a Donnybrook with Belisarius. Those are two heads that he loses. And then in 550, he ends up. He ends up losing another head, a general that he had sent to, to take the place of Belisarius, a guy named Germanus, who could have been the next one of the next emperors. He dies. And then in 551, you got an earthquake happening in Beirut. All right, what we call Beirut. They had a different name for it slightly. And it caused tsunamis. It was really horrible. All right, all of this before he gets it in his head that he's God. Now you beginning to notice something? It's disaster after disaster after disaster all the way through here. He's not getting what he wants. Okay? And oh yeah, finally the Bishop of Rome agrees because Italy's depopulated and he doesn't want to be underneath the control of the Goths. So there's a sort of peace that ensues there, but you still got Persia in the south fighting and the Jews and the Samaritans are with that because they don't they don't they don't like all these persecuting laws that got passed under Justinian okay so by the time you get here in 558 you're looking at one beaten empire whatever it won is Sisyphean okay Sisyphus that's what my avatar is wherever I am on the internet you, it was a, it's an old Greek myth where a guy was condemned to roll a big boulder up a hill and then he has to roll it back down again and then once he gets to the body he has to roll it up again and that's how he's supposed to spend eternity 
Well, that's pretty much how the Roman Empire is at this point. All of its gains might as well be losses. Not only that, but he spent, he, he, he had like three years, well, no, seven, three to seven years income when he starts all this stuff back up here that he had inherited from Justin and uh, Anastasius. And by the time he gets here, he's in debt. There's no money to pay his troops. He had to cut postal service. He had to cut a lot of services. And like I said, they were so low that they didn't even have enough money to defend Constantinople. And it's a sheer miracle that our boy Belisarius won against 2,000 cavalry could have gotten into Constantinople. That's how they weren't defending themselves. Okay? They had put all their troops and all their money and all their everything everywhere else, and they were laying wide open, and the people who they were playing games with up here finally get their minds on and say, oh, well, we should just go to Constantinople. 2,000 horse. That's all it was. And Constantinople would not have been able to withstand it. Now, you think, if you call yourself Christian and holy, and you're all concerned about God, that all of these Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 occurrences, just like the book of Revelation tells you about all the signs and wonders in the sky, like Matthew 24 warned, you think that they'd wake up and smell the coffee and say, gee, we're doing something wrong. But you know what happens instead? And that's what this text is showing you. The seven heads, seven mountains are. In other words, prior to this point, there was a little more give and take between the emperor and the church. And yeah, their doctrines are wrong. But at least the emperor isn't trying to control the church entirely. All right? And the church, of course, in the beginning was trying to control the emperor at, at, from Constantine forward. That's how come we got into this mess is that they politicized starting in 118 AD. And that's in the so-called church father writings. You can see how it started just by reading them. It's really bilious stuff. You need Pepto-Bismol. But it comes to this, I am the massive leader and ruler, and what I say by 553 goes. That's why this text is here. It is the formation of the, what do you want to call it, tyranny. I mean, the church is wrong. It's exercising its own tyranny over the people. But you could always vote with your feet and go somewhere else. But once the political ruler is asserting his control over the church, then you got seven heads, seven mountains are. And that, of course, was what the picture showed. I'm going to come to this in a minute. That's what this picture is. Now, this guy on the second left might actually be the chief lawyer of the Justinian Code. But it looks like, since they're dressed the same, that they're the, the two main generals that Justinian used, and these are the troops. But on the right, these three guys on the right, this guy is something of a friar, okay? This guy is obviously an acolyte of some kind who is really important, and this guy is obviously the chief priest. I do not know who this one is. He's bearing some resemblance to Justinian. But Justinian didn't have any kids. So I'm not sure who this guy is. That's the one that I'm not sure about. But see, you got the seven heads or seven mountains. Seven mountains of power, which is what the seven mountains movement, see, if you want to get a precis of their doctrine behind Trump, that's what they stand for. The seven heads or seven mountains. And that's when it forms during this period from 545 to 554. 556. In other words, it's the wrong reaction to all the judgment coming from God. Because I, I ended my last segment. What is God's reply? Well, the truth is God's been replying all along. And what is Justinian's reply to God's reply? Hardening his heart just like Pharaoh. 
okay? And that's called the Three Chapters, and it actually started in 545 directly with the Pope, with Justinian summoning the Pope. While Rome is under siege, he sends a ship to collect the Pope. Now, you can look up all this stuff. The fastest way, although it's in Latin, is this thing. This is called the Fasti Romani. What it is, is it's an annual, uh, it's, it's like annals. What happened during, the, sort of like an annual yearbook. What happened during that year with, in Rome, whether it was Eastern Rome or Western Rome. Okay, so if you could click on this link, and you can download this too, see, it's free. You can download it, and you can search it, but it's easier to use online. That's the AD year, and you could click on this link. I'm not going to do it because it takes too long to get back here. You could click on that link and get a sort of annual process for what happened during 530 AD. So this is annual. And this is really the, the best place for it. The problem is you got to either, you know, paste the Latin into Google if you can't read it or figure it out. But Latin's a lot like most languages in the West. So you should be able to pick out a lot of it. Okay? So this is the year by year, blow by blow. And this is the only place you can find it. I've been looking for a good annual timeline um, on Justinian, and, and nobody's got one. They all, you know, repackage the information in the categories. This is the true annual, and this is the official annual that the Romans kept. This is their own um, recording of what happened that year. Now, they might be off by one year or, or other that, you know, once we do our, you know, evaluation of what they said, because nobody ever writes 100% rightly. So you have to always proof what somebody claims, including me, of course. And so, you know, they might say it's 536, and we say, well, it's really 537. They might say it's 538. We might say it's 539. The same thing here, especially because I don't know what fiscal year John's using. He switches fiscals a lot. But it seems to fit, you know, the years that we have in our history books anyway. So the point is, is that God's reply has been all along. One bad thing after the next bad thing after the next bad thing, which in their culture would communicate to them divine displeasure. That was what they, that's how they interpreted things even before they believed in Christ. It was very much entrenched in pagan culture long before you had, you know, um, anybody Christianize. And so, of course, when they Christianize, it's, it's really mostly pagan. Catholicism is, is really Diocletian with the Christian name slapped on it. There's very little about it that's actually in the accurate per scripture. All right. Yes, Jesus Christ lived. Yes, he paid for your sin. Yes, there's Trinity. About pretty much everything else, and they don't even get those definitions right. In fact, they fought over the definition of God, and they're still fighting over the definition of God right here. And that's why you have Justinian finally saying, I'm the head of the church. Because it was the Council of Chalcedon, was God has, has got two natures, versus the Monophysite saying, well, he's human and somehow also magically God. And they killed each other over this. Ever since Constantine's sons, actually ever since Constantine, and they never resolved it. That nobody, it didn't occur to them. Oh, well, okay, belief is a private matter. You believe what you want. I believe what I want. No, they had to amalgamate it with the state. The seven had seven mountains are. That's the amalgamation, the unity of church and state, which is precisely and exactly what's happening to us as I talk right now. That is the same doctrine there. These are the people behind Trump. They're Protestant. They're not Catholic. But the Russian Catholics in Russia behind Putin have the same points. They're all aiming to dominate the world, and that will bring Christ back. Well, that was what Justinian thought he was doing. So they're all little antichrists. And highlighted in black honey is what's happening to our world as I talk. Justinian didn't learn that lesson. 
Justinian actually thought he was holy to do the very satanic thing that the Bible is right here in Black Warning against with plagues, with earthquakes, with wars that he doesn't win, with spending money and spending money and spending money and it didn't work. He spent hundreds of thousands of pounds of gold to keep out these northern tribes. 300,000 pounds of gold just to get Italy back, which he only retained for a very short time. That was what he inherited when he came to the throne from the previous emperors. 320,000 pounds of gold. And he spent it all just trying to get Italy back. And then he wrecks the whole thing by telling the Pope, well, I'm, I'm your head. I'll tell you what, what the doctrines are going to be. See? He didn't listen. He didn't recognize, oh, I'm interfering with the freedom of God and the individual, for the person to have private faith between God and the individual, which was always the rule in the Old Testament. It did not change. If anything, it was supposed to be a higher freedom. Galatians, book of Galatians is on that. But Justinian didn't know anything in the Bible. He certainly didn't know this. And the Christians who are doing the Seven Mountains thing behind Trump, they're trying to get this to go again. Right as I talk. The ones in Russia and the ones behind Trump in America. They're all trying to get this to happen. We are looking at the rise of the beast. Does that mean the revelate that the tribulation is going to occur? Well, it's going to feel like it. Okay? It's going to feel like it. I've already done the Matthew 24 videos on that period. It's Matthew 25, 12. All right. And it's broken up into three phases, a seven-year phase, a six-year phase, and a five-year phase. But since we're told it's going to be broken into those phases, I'm not betting that the rapture is going to happen, especially since it's really productive afterwards. 50% of us are nutso now, according to that section of the Bible, and it's going to end up being two-thirds of us are actually productive and learn scripture as a result. Well, then that doesn't sound like the rapture is going to happen. Okay? But I, I could be wrong. It could, the rapture could happen tomorrow. You're not allowed to know when it's going to happen. That's Acts 1. Okay? I'm just, you know, I'm just giving a guess that this has to do with the ending of the 2000 for qualifying spiritual maturation reasons, not for, for rapture, but rapture can happen for bad reasons. Rapture can happen because there are too many people involved in this very black action happening as I talk. So yeah, rapture can happen before I finish speaking. It might not happen for 60,000 years. I don't know. Okay? So now when we get here, since he didn't listen all this time, 557, 558. There's a little lull with the Persians. So he's getting a chance to think. Yeah, but Constantinople has no defenses. So 2,000 horse coming from the north, just a split of cavalry, can actually invade Constantinople and Justinian's orders finally out of retirement, Belisarius, who wins against those guys with 300 troops standing on the, on the, as it were, the high parts and shooting down arrows and stuff like that on the cavalry as it comes. Oh, that was great, but he no sooner wins his victory than the Hagia Sophia dome falls. And therefore, at when they have no money to even to build their defenses, they got no money to build that temple. But they spend it. They spend what they don't have. On top of that, the plague hits them again. So now they don't even have laborers. As a result of the earthquake that fell the temple, well, they got the plague too. I mean, how many, how many signs and wonders do you need from God before you wake up and say, ah, uh, I must be doing something wrong. Every time something happens to my car or something happens to my computer, it's like a wake-up call. I've learned that. It took me several years before I realized God uses those things. Okay, so why didn't Justinian figure this out? He doesn't. There is a lull in fighting with the Persians. Okay? 
that's good because you know, like you know everybody's devastated economically in Constantinople. All right. Over the next, those are three. Hey, Gune, that's three years. So this is 58, 59, 60, 61, and then 62 at Kat. There's a rebellion. I forget, some businessman, because, you know, they were having trouble with the crops, they were having trouble with the labor, they were being taxed to death. Some businessman said, you know what, I should be, I should be in power instead of Justinian. And somebody decided that he was going to accuse Belisarius, who, you know, he's 80 years old here. 80, one, two, three. He's 84 years old. What, what, why would he want to overthrow Justinian? Fortunately, at this time, I don't know how it gets resolved, but Justinian realizes, oh, Belisarius isn't guilty. And this is when Procopius writes his book about buildings. It's a happy book. It's saying how good Justinian was and how he rebuilt and how he helped Rome. Okay, well, that's all kind of bogus because he did a lot of building here and he did a lot of building here and it didn't help. He built fortress after fortress after fortress after fortress and it didn't keep anybody out. He refortified his whole empire. He's in total debt at this point. They won't lend him money. He can't get loans. So he passes a law about loans, which nobody obeys. Okay? But that's that. And then that's 564, and this is the year he dies. Now, he dies in November. I don't know what month it was, but in the same year, Belisarius dies too. And that's the end of our Antichrist. In the next segment, I'm going to go through what, I don't know, maybe you'll come up with better answers, but what sort of hits me about the, like, epilogue of this story. Peace out.